gave a three hour lecture yesterday on astrology, so I could talk, start talking about stars and zodiac signs, just let me know. Um, but today I'm going to try to take a quick tour all around the state. We won't get to every corner of the state, but I'll get on quite a few of them. Um, I've given you all a map. The library was gracious enough to make copies of for everyone. It's a map you can get a color version of on the Pennsylvania DC and our website. If you just Google it, the geographic map of Pennsylvania Church. Or you can type in the map number either on Google or on the website, on the DC and our website, and it will pop up a nice color version that you can print out. So I also like to give a little introduction to geography when I give my talks because not a lot of us in the U.S. have had a good background in geography. I think I had a six-month class in, or a three-month, one semester of geography class in the eighth grade and then I had them in college. So. Geography, I like to say, is a perspective. It's a way of looking at the world. Uh, looks at it spatially, so you're looking at locations, places, regions, and the relationships between them. Anything spatial can be studied by a geographer. So if you're talking about baseball games, or baseball teams, or what people eat for Sunday dinner, or what religions are in a particular part of the world, um, all of those things have spatial component to them that they can be studied geographically. So, unlike a lot of specialized disciplines, geography synthesizes a lot of different subjects. And the one thing that unifies all of it is this spatial perspective. The origins of the world, of the word geography, are geo and dia and graphene. So in Greek, these mean the earth, and describing writing or mapping. So literally, geography means to describe, write about, and map the earth. And that's exactly what geographers do. I'm going to be talking a lot about regions tonight. A map is a map of regions, geographic regions. So when I looked up that word, uh, physiographic, it just said geographic. I was like, oh, that's what that means. You never knew that. Okay, so it's geographic regions of the state. And it's based on the geology uh, underneath the surface and also the surface features. So all of the physical characteristics uh, of the landscape, primarily the non-human uh, aspects of the landscape. But as we see, and as we study in geography, there's a lot of interaction between the physical landscape and the people that live on it. So regions are concepts that are put onto the map. They're a way that geographers organize areas. And a region has some kind of a boundary around it. It can be a, a very distinct boundary or it can be very fuzzy. It can change over time or be very fixed in place. So state and county boundaries are very fixed in place. Boundaries like regions between baseball team fans, fans of all memorials versus fans of Yankees versus fans of the Phillies, those can be much more fluid. Or people who read this newspaper or that newspaper, those can be much more fluid. They're usually contiguous, that means it's in one, bounded by one, Boundary, but it doesn't have to be. The United States, of course, has Alaska and Hawaii, which are outside of the contiguous United States. I believe all the boundaries that we'll be looking at, or the regions we'll be looking at today, are contiguous. And basically, a region is just defined by a set of characteristics which are similar within the region and distinguish it somehow from the other regions. So we'll keep that in mind as we're looking at these different regions of Pennsylvania tonight. Okay, so here's an example. This is actually a postcard I bought when I was a kid. If you look carefully at the pictures, you can tell they're kind of old. Uh, I bought one a few years ago, which looks significantly different. I don't have that one in my PowerPoints yet. 
So this is a good way to think about places and regions, right? You have something that's associated with them. So you have the coal mines up around um, Hazleton, the iron and steel around Pittsburgh. You have hiking in central Pennsylvania, the forests in northern Pennsylvania, paper making up by Johnsonburg. Um, a lot of different regions there. Cabbage grow. Apparently, they grow a lot of cabbages in northwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting. It's interesting to see how these change over time. Okay. So keep that in mind. Here's another set of regions. These we call vernacular regions because they're regions that exist in the popular imagination, but they're not very carefully defined on the map. I have a picture from a study that was done by some colleagues of mine when I was a graduate student in Nebraska. And they collected 50 different versions of a map of the Great Plains. And there were 50 different lines drawn on the map. So the Great Plains is an example of one of those regions that everybody knows about what it is like and where it is, but nobody knows exactly where it is. So these regions are good examples of that. Excuse me, sir. Sometimes I like to give my students a blank map of Pennsylvania in this list, and I say, just come home and put in all of these names somewhere. Or you can find them and put them in somewhere. So you just give me a sense of how well you know the state. I want to show this map before we get into the regular part of the lecture because it's a little different from all of the other maps. Um, this is a map of watersheds. I got really obsessed with these watershed maps a couple of years ago and I drew a map of all the rivers in Pennsylvania. Um, basically, it's different because, well, as you'll see in the next map, most of the state follows the underlying geography and geology. But the water, the rivers, run much more directly north and south. And they cut through ridges rather than run along them. So this is a little different map from the other maps that we'll be looking at. Okay. You've got the uh, Delaware River watershed in the east. The main one in the middle is the Susquehanna River watershed. The Potomac River watershed goes into south central Pennsylvania, a very beautiful area in the Virginia Valley. And of course, in the west, you have the Ohio River watershed, which is primarily drained by the Allegheny River and the Monongahela River. This is the Allegheny, and this is the Ohio, once they come together there, on the Beaver River. We also have a tiny portion of the Genesee River watershed, and that's right up here, and that drains into Lake Ontario. A watershed is simply all of the land that's drained by a river, or a set of rivers. So all of the rivers in the Susquehanna River watershed feed into the Susquehanna River, which has two main branches. The north branch here, and the west branch here. And they come together at Sunbury, Northumberland, flow down to Harrisburg, and then all of it drains into the Chesapeake Bay. Delaware River changed into the Delaware Bay, Potomac River also into the Chesapeake Bay, Ohio River into the Mississippi, which flows down the Gulf of Mexico, the Genesee River, as I said, into Lake Ontario. So there's one point where the star is in north central Pennsylvania. It's the only point east of the Mississippi, maybe east of the Rockies, where three rivers or three different watersheds come together that all run into very different, um, very different bodies of water. So this is called a divide. You probably heard about the Continental Divide. In the west, it divides waters that flow into the Mississippi from those that flow in toward the Pacific Ocean. Well, this is a divide that divides waters that end up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The Chesapeake Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. And that's what it looks like. It's a hay field on top of a rise. 
So if you're into those out of the way tourist destinations that nobody else goes to, this is a good one. Okay, so here's the map, simplified version of the map that I handed out to you. I thought we'd start with that. Geographic regions we'll be talking about are the Atlantic Coastal Plain, the Piedmont, the Blue Ridge, and the New England Mountains, the Ridge Valley, and the Appalachian Plateaus, as well as the little strip of the central lowland. Those are the main physiographic provinces in Pennsylvania. And then the map that you have from DCNR subdivides them into smaller and smaller regions. If you have a question, just raise your hand and let me know. I don't mind interactive lectures. Okay, the Pennsylvania Deep Line. This is the area that we live in. It's subdivided into several regions. Um, but basically, it's a rolling, lowland, hills, valleys. <clears throat> Nothing too extreme. It has a lot of historical areas. It also has a lot of industry and a lot of people. The Ridge and Valley. This is an area, if you drive through it, you'll notice these long, narrow ridges and these long, narrow valleys between them. There's some very beautiful overlooks. This is from the top of Tuscarora Ridge in south central Pennsylvania, looking out on one of the valleys and then out onto the Great Valley, uh, which is a larger section we'll talk about later. A lot of small towns. This is Huntington down on the Juniata River in south central Pennsylvania, south of State College. And this is on the top of the ridge on Jacks Mountain, uh, kind of southeast, southeast of Lewisburg, or Lewistown, rather. The way that you get from one valley to the other is often through a, a gap, almost a ridge, a gap. And the gap can have a stream flowing through it, or it can be dry, in which case it's called a wind gap. If there's a spring flowing through it, it's called a water gap. But the gaps are the primary way that people get from, and have always gotten from one ridge to another. As you can see from these pictures, going up over the top of the ridges takes a lot of work. The Appalachian Plateau. It looks like a lot like the Ridge and Valley, except I like to say the, um, the mountains. I always put that in quotes in case someone from Colorado or California is here. Uh, the mountains are shaped a little more like, you know, when you make uh, dinner rolls and you put them in the oven, they kind of expand and run into each other. So you get these big mountains that are all running into each other. That's kind of what the mountains and the plateau look like. Whereas the ridge and valley are these long, narrow ridges that run for tens of miles sometimes over 100 miles. This is probably the most picture I took in one of the most isolated towns of uh, any size, uh, any substantial size. This is Renovo in north central Pennsylvania. It was built there because it was a railroad um, town uh, where railroads would gather and make repair road, railroads and uh, train cars. Okay. It's a little hard to think sometimes when you're standing up front. Uh, but it's there because of the railroads, and of course the railroads are gone now, so there's not a lot going on in the town, but it's a cool place to drive through. Uh, oil City, which was one of the towns at the center right at the beginning of the oil industry, the global oil industry. Uh, the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum, which I'll mention again, and uh, Pittsburgh, also in this region. And this is a bridge you've all driven over if you've gone on I-80 through western Pennsylvania. Um, it is the only bridge in the state that goes over parts of three counties. Because there's a little sliver of Armstrong County that comes off between Butler and Jefferson counties uh, that runs underneath this bridge. So you actually go over part of three counties when you drive over that bridge. Okay. So those are the main, three main ones, a quick overview of each of them. 
and we'll talk about the other ones, the Bloom Ridge, and down around Gettysburg, Shippensburg, that area, and the Reading Prong, which is the area around Reading, all the way over to Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton. So you notice there are also mountains um, around these areas. And they're part of an older mountain chain. The Atlantic Coastal Plain on the left, Philadelphia, she's done a really nice job of putting some parkways and walkways in along the, uh, some pretty along the Scoopal River. And down at Cape May Point, southernmost tip of New Jersey, it's the same physiographic region. It's flat. It means it's just sediment that's been collected underneath. It's not rock, that's why you get lots of potholes in areas of Philadelphia. And if you go all the way over to the other side of the plateau, so here's the Atlantic Coastal Plain. If you go all the way over the other corner of the state on the back side of the plateau, you get the central lowlands. And this goes all around the Great Lakes and through the Ohio, the Mississippi, and Missouri River Valley. So it's a huge province. It takes up most of the central part of the continent. This is the escarpment that marks the end of the plateau. There are a lot of grapes growing along those slopes. And then this is looking from the top of the escarpment down onto the narrow plain before you get to Lake Erie. So those are the basic regions of the state. And we're just going to go into more detail with this uh, throughout the rest of the lecture. Any questions so far? OK, so here's the map that I gave you. There's a nice color version that you can all hopefully access and download and print. See the Piedmont province here, so all of these purple areas here, the coastal plain. Here's the New England province, the Red Prom, and the South Mountain or the Blue Ridge province. The Great Valley, something we'll talk about that's technically part of Appalachia, but it's very much connected to the Piedmont. And then you have the ridges and valleys. And that's all these blue areas here. The Allegheny Front, now being started to divide the ridge valley from the plateau. The plateau are all these orange and green sections, including the Pocono Plateau, which is right here. Some have been glaciated, and others have not. And then you have the other coastal province up here. So I got started on this whole um, geography thing when I was taking classes uh, to become a volunteer naturalist at Bone Hill up in Bucks County. And so they handed out this map, and I just got obsessed with it. So I started looking into it. And I've been looking into it for 10 years and just driving around the state taking pictures, um, exploring these areas, reading about them, buying books. And it just keeps evolving and growing. Okay. Let's start with the two little mountain sections in the east. About a billion years ago, there were mountains that formed in what later became Eastern North America. So these are pretty old rocks. And the Earth, they say, is about four and a half billion years old. So that's going to be these two areas that are pointed out on the map. And these are places where the rocks that were part of those mountains are still coming up to the surface. The mountains themselves aren't part of the original mountains, but the rocks underneath them are. The mountains themselves have been formed and reformed many times. And these mountains are part of an extended chain 
includes the Green Mountains of Vermont, the Taconics in western Massachusetts, the Red Prong of Pennsylvania, South Mountain, the Blue Ridge, all the way down to the Great Smokies. It's all the same origin for all of these different mountains, different ranges. The geography of the region, especially the southern part, the Blue Ridge province, South Mountain, between Gettysburg and Chambersburg, is especially suited for growing uh, apple orchards. Sorry, the picture is pretty dark. The sun was really bright, so it was hard to get a good picture. But the hill is covered in apple trees. And the reason for this is that the slope, the size of the slope, create the ideal balance between warmth and coolness. So it's cool enough on the sides of the hills that in early spring, that the trees won't come out soon in the spring. So they'll avoid an early season frost, or a late season frost. But then it's also high enough up that the cold air drains down into the valley. And so it keeps, it protects them uh, from exceptionally cold air. And then in the fall, it stays warm enough for them to extend the growing season a bit. So you often see orchards and vineyards uh, along the sides of slopes. And particularly in uh, near a lake, near a large lake, which also helps moderate the temperatures. Uh, or in a um, slightly mountainous area, uh, like South Mountain. Very picturesque area, a lot of historic areas. This is obviously, this has been settled for a long time. Okay, let's switch over to the Reddick Prong. Pagoda is up on top of the Redding. I always get lost around going around Redding. You can never get the highways to look up right for me. So I end up somewhere down in Redding, and I just look up to the Pagoda, and I keep winding through the city until I'm keeping the Pagoda on my left until I get down to 422. So it's a useful landmark for me. <laughs> Gives a great view of the valley, and it's up on top of one of these hills which is part of the leftover mountain chain that formed a billion years ago. You also see these mountains if you're driving up the center of Berks County. I take my class on a field trip up to Hawk Mountain um, when we're learning about these different provinces. And so we take 422 up until it comes off the end of the expressway, and then just about a mile down the road, 662, goes off to the right, and that goes right up the center of Berks County. So you are driving up through there, through the Butter Valley, you start to see these hills come up on the right, and that's the Redding Prong as well. Okay. The Great Valley section. This is the, <clears throat> technically the first part of Appalachia. It's a wide, narrow valley, or a wide valley. Uh, it has hills in it too, but broadly speaking, it's a valley. And it runs from many miles north and south through Pennsylvania and on into other states. It was a very useful area for settlers, and it has good soil for farming. So I drove out Route 30 one winter to visit some friends in Cleveland. So everybody goes to Cleveland in the middle of winter, right? <laughs> when I was driving on Route 30, I got to this point near the Ridge and Valley, where I looked back and you could see South Mountain in the distance. And you turned around and you could see the first ridge from the Ridge and Valley ahead of me. So that was pretty neat. It's a beautiful area. There's a lot of scenic areas in the Great Valley. Okay. So the Great Valley is part of this region here, provided it is this region, the Great Appalachian Valley is the full name of it. So it goes all the way from Alabama, up between the Ridge Valley and the Smokies, all the way up through Virginia, into Pennsylvania, 
up into New York. It connects with the Mohawk Valley and the, and the Champlain Valley up to the St. Lawrence Valley. And the only place, okay, it's called three things in Pennsylvania. The eastern end is the Lehigh Valley, the middle part is the Lebanon Valley, and the western and southernmost part is the Cumberland Valley. So if you might be familiar with those names. The only place along this whole set of mountains and the Great Valley where there's a real break in the mountains is in Pennsylvania. And so that became a really important uh, route for both for European settlers who were looking to uh, go somewhere else after the lands along the eastern seaboard were filling up. And it was also a good route for indigenous populations who also wanted to leave the crowded European settlements uh, along the eastern seaboard. And basically what people would do is to cut through this part of Pennsylvania and then head south down the Great Valley. Uh, Daniel Boone was the first one of the first ones to do this. And his family cut through the Cumberland Gap, which is where Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee come together. And from there, the settlers could go into the uh, Tennessee River Valley, up into the Ohio Valley, and into the Midwest and Great Lakes region. The French, when they settled, came down the St. Lawrence River into the Great Lakes and accessed the Midwest that way. But the English uh, European settlers along the eastern seaboard primarily came across the mountains, or this was a much easier way to get into the Midwest going south along the Great Valley and then through the Cumberland Gap. Okay, so Daniel Boone, if you drive out 422, there's a sign that points to the west a few miles. There's the Daniel Boone homestead. That's where he spent some time as a boy. Uh, they have a lot of outdoor buildings. They have an old uh, house, which was added on to since uh, he had grown up there, but there's one part of it down at the end, which is part of the original house. And they do some wonderful living history things out there. They like grow flax and spin it and make their clothes from it. They cook over the hearth. They have all the old recipes. They tell you what it was like, uh, you know, living in the winter, closed up in a house with baking fat lamps burning and people not, you know, bathing for a month. Um, you know, they really get into it, they know everything about it, so it's a cool place to visit. There are a lot of cities and towns in the Great Valley in Pennsylvania, so all of these, including Harrisburg and Nashville, Reading, Allentown, Bethlehem, as well as Easton, Nashville, Lebanon, Hershey, Carlisle, and Chambersburg. And there was a reason that so many towns are in the Great Valley. Basically, colonial Pennsylvania was owned by the Penn family. It was their business. And William Penn and his sons and other parts of the family developed their colony in such a way that Philadelphia would not be competed against by other towns and cities in the region. So they allowed Philadelphia to become the primary economic center of the colony. And they discouraged settlements from growing within a day's wagon ride of Philadelphia. So it was the backcountry area out past that, maybe 50 miles out, which developed in the 1700s along with Philadelphia. And the area in between didn't really fill in uh, until the late 1700s, around the 1800. So places like Coatesville, Norristown, Phoenixville, Darlingtown, uh, Doylestown, those areas really didn't grow into more significant population centers uh, until later in the 1700s, whereas a lot of these towns were founded in the early mid 1700s. Okay, so pictures from the Lehigh Valley. 
This is a view from the south overlook of Hawk Mountain, looking back into the Great Valley. Beautiful place if you can get up there. They now have a fully accessible trail from the visitor center up to the south mountain uh, overlook, or south overlook. This is Lebanon Valley. You see a lot of bicyclists on these roads when they drive out there. It's very pretty. Nice rolling landscape. <clears throat> a lot of farms and older uh, historic homes as well. Cumberland Valley. So here's Chambersburg, um, or Carlisle and Chambersburg. Uh, these are the ridges of the Ridge Valley. And then this is South Mountain here, part of the Blue Ridge province. So the Great Valley is this wide area. And here's the Pennsylvania Turnpike. So if you're driving west from Harrisburg, you go for a long ways through the Great Valley. And then you come up to the tunnel through the mountains here. I think it's Blue Mountain Tunnel, or is that the one in 476? This is part of a map, one of my favorite atlases, which is the DeLorean Atlas. So they still um, do publish these. They used to have them on CDs, but um, another company bought them, I think maybe Rand McNally bought them or something, and they stopped publishing them on CDs. Um, but they did, last I heard, they were still publishing a paper version. It has a lot of information about recreational areas at the beginning, uh, different places to visit, and the maps themselves, you're not going to use them for navigating through a city. Uh, this is a great map to use, an atlas to use for the back country. Uh, it basically has all the roads, the natural areas, natural features. Uh, it's a really fun map to have. I'll show you this while we're at it. This is the National Geographic Atlas of Pennsylvania. This is also a really nice one, um, especially for uh, state parks and natural areas and other places you might want to explore. And the Atlas part is a little easier to read, too. So I have several, several Pennsylvania atlases. Um, they're all a little bit different, so I bring like three or four of them along when I go on a trip. And I can compare and plan trips um, using all of them. Okay, here's the western edge of the Cumberland Valley. Um, looking for Mercersburg Academy, which is an elite school in South Central Pennsylvania. Originally one of the, I originally believe it was Marshall College, and then they merged with Franklin College, and they moved out of Mercersburg, and it was a theological seminary for a while, and became a private school. Broad Mountain, uh, Front Mountain, one of some of the first mountains in the Ridge and Valley, you're driving west on Route 30. And then this is uh, Cove Mountain back here, and in Cove Gap uh, was where Pennsylvania's only president uh, was born, uh, James Buchanan. Uh, I don't know why he left the valley, it's beautiful back there. Um, it's a really nice place. Um, and basically it was a transfer place for um, freight that was being delivered by wagon over the mountains. Also in the Cumberland Valley, I came across the Kanachiki, uh, Kanakachi Institute, which is um, kind of like a living history area. We have a lot of different buildings that they've brought there and uh, farms, old uh, gardens, and some natural areas with trails in it. It gives you a sense of the natural history of the area. It's kind of fun. Okay, so we've talked about the Reading Drum, South Mountain, and the Great Valley. So I want to take a look at this area again called the Pennsylvania Piedmont. There are three different sections. The Upland section, there is, um, actually here's a non-contiguous region. The Piedmont Lowland actually has this long narrow valley here. And then this much broader area in northern, mostly in northern Lancaster County. And then there's the Gettysburg, New York Lowland, sometimes also called the Triassic Lowland. And there are local names for that area that I'll tell you about too. So here's Montgomery County and uh, Delaware County. So this is our area. The 
Piedmont region was the first area of Pennsylvania to be settled. Much of it was occupied by 1720. All of it, plus the Great Valley, was essentially initially settled um, by 1740. The largest cities are Philadelphia and then Lancaster. Another thing that you can see in this map is that the southeast filled up relatively quickly, but it took a long time to get across those ridges and to get into the central part of the state. And the north central part of the state wasn't settled until the 1800s. The peak area up here was the late 1800s, and they cleared out pretty quickly. About 20 years later, people started leaving. a couple pictures of the Piedmont up um, I don't think they do this anymore, but two years ago you could drive up to the top of the landfill at the water boundary between Chester and Lancaster counties. You get a good view of the Piedmont from up there. It's the town of Honeybrook. And pretty similar view when you're driving east on Route 30 in York County. Southeastern Pennsylvania. 
Pennsylvania. And those things spread throughout the country. So I lived in Nebraska for 10 years. And on the state highway signs, the symbol that they use for this around the root number is a Conestoga wagon. Those Conestoga wagons originated in southeastern Pennsylvania, in Conestoga roads um, throughout southeastern Pennsylvania. That's because settlers from this area took them to move to other parts of the country. So geographers call this a cultural heart. Um, so southeastern Pennsylvania, the Piedmont, the Great Valley, it's a cultural, a Euro American cultural art in North America. It's one of several cultural arts. Another one is New England. Another is the Tidewater areas in the Southeast. Um, yeah, I'll listen to that. Okay. Just mention a little bit about rocks here. There are several different categories of rocks, igneous. It's the ones formed from fire, from lava, from melted material. The other kinds are sedimentary, which is formed just from sediment that over time accumulates and gets cemented together into a rock. And a third kind is metamorphic. Metamorphic is rocks that haven't melted, but they've been subjected to a lot of heat and pressure. And the heat and the pressure kind of change the crystal and structure of the rocks, changes their chemistry. It's the same materials in them, but how they're put together changes. So sediment, example of sedimentary rock is graphite, which is just sheets of carbon. So when you write with a pencil, you're just separating the sheets of carbon from one another and leaving some on the paper. Anybody know the metamorphic equivalent of graphite? Curved diamonds? So rather than being in sheets of carbon, a diamond is bound in all directions. So the carbon atoms are linked to all the other carbon atoms around it, which makes it the hardest mineral uh, on Earth. Okay. Same thing, they're both made of carbon, just carbon. But the way that they're um, way that the, the mineral is constructed, is structured, is different. <clears throat> so oftentimes you'll get sedimentary rocks that have been in areas, they build up in along shores and in shallow water areas uh, and in slightly deeper sea areas. And then if there's some mountain building going on, if those sedimentary rocks are in an area where continents start coming together and building, mountains like they are in the Himalayas now, then the rock is subjected to that heat and pressure and it turns into a metamorphic rock. And so there are a lot of metamorphic rocks in southeastern Pennsylvania. Once you move farther west, it's more sedimentary. And this is important because it's shape the kind of use that people can make of the land. So a couple hundred years ago, it was a lot easier to travel on water than it was on land. But in Pennsylvania, it was hard to travel on water unless you had a really shallow, specially built boat, because the rocks underneath the rivers are very hard metamorphic rocks. And so the water can't carve out the channel very easily. So they ended up building a lot of canals. So this is the Susquehanna River down south of Route 30. And this is the canal that was built next to it. And it's built, you see a lot of chunks of metamorphic schist lying around on the ground. Geographers talk about site and situation. Site means the place itself and its characteristic. Situation is how it's related to other places around it. And if you look at the site of Harrisburg, it's on a river, but the river is shallow, so ships can't go on the river. The Delaware River is the same way north of Trenton. If it weren't for 
that particular site characteristic, Harrisburg would be a fantastic port city. And it would probably be as big as Pittsburgh, maybe even Philadelphia. Because it's got all of the resources of the farms from the southeast and the forests up in the north. And it's right there at, in the Great Valley, which links to all, a lot of other parts of the country. It is a major transportation hub, that region. And people who, friends of mine that live there, say the pollution is pretty bad from all the trucks and the interstates. But it's not a major port city. And that's just because of the geology. Lancaster is also influenced by the geology. It was laid out by James Hamilton. It began its role as the county seat of Lancaster County on May 10, 1729. Astrologers like those precise dates because then they can make a chart and like make up stories about the place and understand them. Um, Lancaster is unique because it was the only major town in America, in colonial America, that was not situated on a river or along the coast. There's Conestoga Creek, but that's not very big. It flows through it on the way to Susquehanna. It was entirely dependent on roads and canals for connections to other cities and towns. It was the only one that grew away from a river or the coastline. That's really significant and really interesting. And it's all because of the geology again. So Pennsylvania developed a lot of turnpikes and they built a lot of canals. And I'm talking the early colonial version of the turnpike, where it was a plank road or a dirt road. And somebody tried to charge money for using it so that they could maintain it. And a lot of these lasted for a little while and then they went out of business. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about geology. We talked about a billion years ago, there was the Grenville orogeny or mountain building episode. This was what created the Blue Ridge and Red Pond, the rocks underneath those. There, it pulled apart, and then you have some island arcs, a little bit of a chain of islands, like you have off the coast of uh, Asia, for instance, or Japan and the other islands there. And they start moving in, and they glom on to eastern North America, and then another thing comes over, and that starts heading for us, and that gloms on to North America as well. And then Africa comes in. Africa and Europe come in and merge with North and South America, and this creates Pangaea. Okay, this is the one that really is significant for us, because it's what created the Appalachian Mountains. This is what's going on with that. This is kind of like India and Asia, the way it is there now. So think of this as being like the Himalayas or Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We're, we're right in the middle of all this mountain building and we're up about 10, 12,000 feet or more. There are dinosaurs skiing down the slopes and you know, things like that. And then gradually, Pangea began to break up. Um, and whenever something pulls apart, the rocks tend to slip downward, um, and that created this rift valley, uh, which leads to the last bit of our map, which is the uh, Triassic lowlands. So the very, very quick run through four mountain building episodes, and the most significant, the one that left behind some rocks in the Blue Ridge and the New England Mountains, and the other significant one is the last one, uh, which is the Allegheny Orogeny, or mountain building event. <clears throat> and that is what created the Appalachians. Yeah, 10, 12,000 feet higher. Yeah. They've had a lot of time to get worn down. And some geographers and geologists even think they were worn down completely. And then the land kind of rose up a little, and the water carved down mountains again. Um, but they certainly got worn down near flat. So this was about 300 to 220 million years ago. 
And here's kind of Pangea, so you can see northern eastern Africa coming right into the eastern coast of North America. South America is here uh, in southern sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> and all of the other continents were attached together. In the 1960s, they mapped out magnetic stripes on the sea floor. There was a ship called the Lomar Challenger, the Lomar Explorer. It's a really interesting story. And they saw that there was a, a line of uh, a fissure in the bottom of the ocean, and that there were parallel magnetic stripes on either side of that. And from that, they concluded that the land was moving apart in that area. And from that developed plate tectonics theory, which is basically an idea that is still not completely understood. But the idea is that there are kind of these conveyor belts of magma that circulate underneath the surface of the Earth. And they push the plates around, which is a, a thin layer that the continents are made up of and the bottoms of the oceans are made up of. And they push those plates around. And they, so they move around and get earthquakes and volcanoes. And over time, these continents come apart, reform, push together. It's not really understood in a lot of depth what exactly causes that and what exactly the mechanism is. But I like to think of it as just these kind of convection currents underneath the surface and they're like conveyor belts that push these parts of the surface around. So 
the water hits, you know, it freezes, thaws, breaks up the rocks, starts getting washed down, collects down in the valley. Every once in a while, the sea comes in, and then it retreats. And so the sediments are accumulating, and the water's coming in and out of this valley. And so all of the iron fragments in the rock that were the rock sediment that was settling in the valley would rust. They would get water when the sea came in, when the sea left, they would be exposed to the air, they would oxidize, and you get this dark red color. And so all of the rocks that develop in the valley have this dark red hue to them. So at Bowman's Hill, by the visitor's garden, they have, uh, by the visitor's center, they have a kind of a garden, like a version of all the, many of the native plants that they grow there, like in a miniature version. And they have two parts to the garden. One shows the sedimentary rocks of the area, which are this red shale. And the other part shows the volcanic rocks, which is diabase. So the shale, as I said, were created from sediments and washed off the mountains, filled in the valley, and then were oxidized, uh, basically, the, the iron and the rust. In. So it's just like if you, you know, have a cast iron skillet and you wash it out and you forget about it, you leave it on the sink, and it dries, the water evaporates, and then you left with the rusty sediment on top of the skillet. Same thing happened to these rocks. Okay, and then from those fissures that developed as the continents were separating, the magma came up to form these volcanic ridges, and they're made of a rock, an igneous rock called andesite. Uh, sorry, diabase. Andesite's another igneous rock. Diabase. You're like, what's he talking about? Let's say that up there. So the Newark Lowland is the eastern part of these Triassic Lowlands, and it's the classic Bucks County landscapes. So the farmscapes, the preserved farmland, and the red shale driveways and the ridges behind them, the small farms and the <coughs> valleys, that's part of the Triassic Lowlands. When you move into this part of the Piedmont, the landscape changes. And you know, these are the things I like to, to teach people so they can go out and start seeing them for themselves. It's more of a patchwork. It's a patchwork of little farms and forests and ridges. And it's just a more broken up landscape than you see when you're driving through the, the upland and lowland provinces. There's a narrow strip of these Triassic lowlands that runs through parts of Lebanon County and other areas in the center part of the uh, central part of the Piedmont. And one of the neat things that's located in uh, this part of the lowlands is Mount Bretna, uh, which is a scaled down version of the Chautauqua Institute in western New York. Uh, if you've heard about that, it was built in the 1800s. It's basically a village, and people go there to hear lectures and um, engage in workshops and put on plays. And it's a beautiful spot right on um, Lake Chautauqua, which is near Lake Erie. Uh, this is a miniature version. It was a very popular thing. Um, they would take it on the road. And sometimes other uh, communities would build their own mini version of Chautauqua. And so Mount Gretna is one of those. And it has programs and these cottages in the woods and, and a theater and um, other places just like Chautauqua does. Okay. Also nearby is Cornwall, which is a town, a Welsh mining, miners village, uh, which had the longest, uh, and I'm not sure if it was the largest, but it was the longest running uh, iron mine in Pennsylvania. Before the big iron mines opened up in northern Michigan and um, northern Minnesota, a lot of iron was mined locally. And so throughout Pennsylvania, you have these iron forges. Um, and uh, the Cornwall uh, mine was one of, the, one of the longest ones. It actually ran into, I think, the 1960s or so, before it was just 
flooded out and it wasn't worth um, filling the water out of it to continue mining in it. And then if you go down to the southern end of the Triassic lowlands, these same ridges that you see in Bucks County and that Mount Breton are built on were also fought over in the Civil War. So Cemetery Ridge is one of those diabase ridges um, that runs through the Triassic lowlands. Okay, time to move on to the second part. About 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. This was one of the major ways that people 
the European settlers got into the central part of the state, were able to um, move into some and start towns in some of the, the central part of the state uh, before 1800. A couple of the towns along the way, uh, Loganton and Sugar Valley, which is East of State College, beautiful area, and Lewistown County seat of Mifflin County. And there are some really small towns. And as the names of these towns suggest, these were kind of the frontier in the 1750s, 1760s. So they were at the front line of Indian raids, um, uh, retaliations by the English uh, settlers. Uh, burnt cabins refers to uh, settlers cabins that were burnt because they were illegal in an area that wasn't supposed to be settled. And then Fort Littleton refers to a fort, which was often just someone's house that settlers could go to when there was trouble. Let's look at the anthracite upland. This is just on the east side of the Susquehanna River, um, but it has coal. And it's coal that has been part of that mountain building process. So it's folded into these layers and it's compressed and it's very hard anthracite coal, which is pretty rare. Um, and because anthracite coal burns a lot cleaner, Philadelphia never got as dirty as Pittsburgh. But it also meant that industrialization couldn't develop as quickly because anthracite coal couldn't be burned in steam engines. They had to figure out how to do that, and that took several decades. Really interesting little towns. I love driving through this area. It's just a world unto itself. And of course, it's uh, experiencing a lot of economic hardship because there really is not much of any uh, anthracite coal mining going on. Um, one of these interesting things, Montanoy City is the site of the first cable television service in the country, um, created in the 1940s. The company is still there. Pioneer Coal Mine Tunnel uh, in Ashland, beautiful little park, town park up on the side of the hill. There's the Mine Tunnel. There are several museums, and Centralia is in this area as well. Centralia is the town. It had a coal mine, it has a coal uh, fire burning underneath it. Because these seams are not level, uh, it's impossible to put these things out or to even know where exactly they are. <coughs> and just past Centralia on the hill, past it, uh, there's this church where people who used to live in Centralia gather every year for a kind of reunion. Okay, so that's this area. And then there's another part of the anthracite region, which is the Wyoming Valley. And that's where Scranton and Wilkes-Barre and all those big cities are. Let's talk about the Susquehanna Lowland. This is in the northern part of the Ridge and Valley. And there's more shale in this area, so a lot of it's been carved out. It's much more open field. Um, it has a lot of farmland, dairy farms. It's a beautiful part of the state. A lot of Amish farms are there. Um, I have a friend who lives up there near Lock Haven. And his I would love to live up there. It's inexpensive and there's good food from Amish farms and it's very scenic, picturesque. So Danville, this is on the north branch of the Susquehanna River. Uh, Lewisburg also. Mifflinburg, home of the Buggy Museum. If you've never seen a museum dedicated to buggies, there's one in Mifflinburg. It's not open every day, so it's one I have. In a town around Kens Creek where there was a massacre um, back in the 1700s. Lock Haven, uh, beautifully situated on the west branch of the Susquehanna River. Um, you have a plateau to the west and to the east you have Bald Eagle Mountain, which is a long ridge that, like Tuscarora Mountain, is a very substantial ridge. It curves all the way up around to Williamsport. Then dividing the two parts of Appalachia is the escarpment or the Allegheny Front. So this is on the back side of the Ridge Valley. And it's an exceptionally steep hill in most places. Around Lock Haven, it's a lot uh, smaller and carved up. But one of the places you can experience this hill, the shift between the plateau and the Ridge Valley, is the escarpment at the Allegheny Portage Railroad. National Historic Site. This is the ramp that they hauled um, canal boats up on 
a uh, railroad track with, with horses pulling uh, cables to haul the canal boats up to get them over onto the plateau when they would go on the canals and rivers that would take them down to Pittsburgh. And that's this section here, and then the escarpment goes all the way up to there. Also, another location on the escarpment up in the northeast by Scranton is uh, Britain's Glen State Park. The Kitchen Creek falls over to the escarpment and creates all these waterfalls. The Portage National Railway, National Historic Site, rather, and just after that was built, the railroads came in. So it was only in use for 10 or 20 years, and they created the Horseshoe Curve, which is still in use. This gets you up part of the escarpment. And if the train's long enough, you can look out the window over here and see the back of the train over here. <laughs> and the Appalachian Plateaus, all of these parts to the west and around to the north. I don't have all of them covered, but we'll run through a few of them. So basically what happened was you have all these folded rock layers in the Ridge Valley as the continents were coming together and they were getting crushed and compressed and twisted. And then there was this giant ramp a fault um, that runs along where the Allegheny front is now. So all those compressed rock layers just slid out this front and ended up, there we go, got too excited there, uh, ended up on top of the rock layers to the west. And that relieved all the built up tension that was accumulating in the Ridge Valley. And so you had much broader, gentler uh, hills in the plateau. It seems steeper because the slopes are gentle enough for people to build on them. And so you have towns like Pittsburgh and Montana and, and those places where you really, you're going up and down these hills. And you might come to a place in the center of the intersection where it literally goes like that. Um, that's because these slopes were a little bit gentler than in the Ridge and Valley, and so they built on them. In the Ridge and Valley, you just go around the ridges or through them in the gaps. In the southwest, in the Allegheny Highlands, you, the Laurel Highlands, you have the highest point in the state, which is Mount Davis. It's up almost 3,000 feet. Um, Johnstown is another uh, city in this area. The steel mill, the old steel mill at the edge of downtown. And instead of having a department store, you now have Dollar General. But you still have Georgia's the oldest record store in America. And then the A client. Most of my pictures of Western Pennsylvania is cloudy and overcast weather. And there in the summer or winter, it always seems to be overcast. And it does have the most overcast days of any part of the state. So there's a lot of small towns that I've explored. Um, it's, it's an interesting area. Uh, get off of my 80s, you know, be amazed at what you discovered. The northern tier is this area of the counties across the northern part of the state, and it's part of the Appalachian Plateau, and it was primarily settled not from people from down in southeastern Pennsylvania, but from people coming over from New England. And you can see that when you get up to the top of these, or when you go in the visitor center, it's in the Mahoney uh, State Park, and they have this model there, you can see that this really is a plateau. It's flat layers of the rock, and they've been carved out by water to create these valleys and gorges. Um, but when you're driving through it, it looks like mountains. You can also see it in this picture. This is one of the highest overlooks in the state. It's off of Pennsylvania 120, north of Lock Haven. Uh, it's called Hinderview State Park, and you have to drive up a narrow winding road to get up to the top there, and it's also a place where people go hang gliding from. There's a ramp there. Uh, and this is up in the off state forest around um, the town of Emporium, which is one of my favorite towns up in the Northwest. Allegheny River, a little tiny little ditch in Cowersport near the source. Pretty wide stream by the time you get down the river to Foxford. Allegheny River actually occurs up in New York State comes down on its way to Pittsburgh. In the northwestern part of the state, you had glaciers that kind of took
took off some of the mountaintops and they filled in the valleys and they gave up, filled it in with a lot of rich soil. So there's some good farmland in the northwestern part of the state. If you get to the unglaciated regions, it's poor soils with very short growing seasons. So the valley has to be lined perfectly in order to support a farm. So you don't see many farms. A lot of what did develop was manufacturing, a lot of small industries. Uh, you had obviously huge industries around Pittsburgh, but a lot of the other parts of the northern tier, you had a lot of small factories. Some of them are still there, some of them are being revived, but obviously they were hit uh, very hard as the U.S. deindustrialized in the 70s. Okay. Towns up there, Cowersport on Route 6, Smithport on Route 6, Austin's a little town where you had the second worst um, dam collapse in the state. Uh, it was a concrete dam that was built around 1901. Uh, it broke apart. There are these huge slabs of concrete with um, rebar coming out of them about 100 yards down from the main dam. Two years ago, the um, and there were lumber mills in the valley below it and then the town below that. And so all the lumber that was in the mills got washed in the town, just made a mess of everything. Killed a lot of people. The, um, the high school kids and the historical society created a park around the dam, which is really nice and there's a lot of historic interpretation. Bradford, another town up there, is the center of oil and gas industry and home of Zippo, knife, uh, Zippo lighters and case knives. The oil heritage region, oil was discovered there. Um, a driller on, uh, that was working for Colonel Drake drilled the first oil well, a uh, commercial oil well in the world. That was in 1859, and that was the beginning of today's global oil industry. Here's some of the towns up there. Really interesting place to explore. Franklin's another one of my favorite towns. Oil City is a real interesting downtown. This is the exchange where um, the oil market used to be located at the beginning of the industry. It's fascinating. There's nothing there now. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a state park where you can bicycle or take a train through. So they market this area now as the Pennsylvania Wilds. Uh, a lot of state parks, state forests, the Allegheny National Forest in the West. Cherry Springs State Park is a dark skies park. It's one of the darkest areas in the Northeast. Um, so every all summer, every month when there is a new moon, that weekend, the weekend before, right after the new moon, they have a star party. And you can go up. A series of astronomers have their own field over here. And then on the other side of the road, uh, Pennsylvania 44, Jersey Shore uh, Pike, because uh, it goes from Jersey Shore up to um, Cowersport. Not the Jersey Shore, but the Jersey Shore on the Susquehanna River in the town. Uh, WPA pavilions, which are really nice, um, and they have a amphitheater across the road, across PA 44, where the public can gather and hear a presentation at the amphitheater and look at stars. The Lumber Museum was another cool place up on Pennsylvania 6. They had a lot of outdoor buildings, a sawmill, which they get up and operate about three, four times a year, and you just stand there watching it. Like, wow, this is so cool. They're pulling the log off the ramp in the sawmill. They're taking the bark off, squaring it off, slicing in the boards, stacking them, and putting them out on the ramp to dry. And you just stand there and watch it. It's a fascinating process. Okay. Here we go. Questions? You gonna take questions? Sure. Yes. We have one here in the library.
What was the question? Yeah, there, you uh, referred to alluvial fans, which exist in the west. It's a, it's a lot of sediment that's washed out into a fan-shaped deposit off of a, off of a bluff or a slope. Um, the short answer to that is no, not on the current landscape, but a lot of those rocks that the sandstone and limestone and shale, or the sandstone and shale rocks that cover the whole western part of the state were originally part of and the alluvial fan that washed off of the mountains that were to the east hundreds of millions of years ago. So yes and no. <laughs> yes. Well, um, ocean levels have been rising, and what they're finding as the Arctic and Antarctic are affected. It's creating a positive feedback loop, which speeds up the process. So, as I have jokingly say to my students, you might want to invest in some property in West Philadelphia because it might be shorefront property. It was at one time. <laughs> There's the fall line that divides the Piedmont from the coastal plain, and it runs through uh, parts of Philadelphia. The coastal plain is made up of sediment that the ocean has washed up on top of the bedrock. And that's why there's so many potholes in Philadelphia. It's just sediment. It's not solid rock underneath the streets. Um, so that means that, yes, at one time, the ocean washed all this stuff up to there, and that was the edge of the ocean. It was running through parts of West Philadelphia, uh, Gino Bartram's Gardens. The fall line runs right through the front um, yard of is not uh, home. Um, so yeah, so it, it could be, again, questions? There are a couple of areas in the West Bay where I guess the glacier came down and caught the rocks. Mm -hmm. The place full of very old blue rocks. Mm -hmm. and there are place where the state parks. Up in uh, Hickory Run, maybe. Hickory Run. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so what happens there, they're not directly related to glaciers, but what happens is the, the boulders up on the ridge top, and if you hike the escarpment trail to Hawk Mountain, you can actually see this along with other ridges. Water gets in there in the winter, it freezes in the cracks and it pushes the stones apart and starts to break them up. So gradually over time, these huge chunks of rock break off the ridge and they tumble down into the valley. Eventually, they end up piling down into the valley, and it creates those boulder fields that you see at Hickory Run and also at Hawk Mountain, which is near the rocks. They're not directly from glaciers, but the glaciers were nearby, and um, when the glaciers melted, it released tons and tons of water, as you can imagine, and that pushed a lot of these rocks down into the valley, as well as it also created the weather that allowed for a lot of freezing and thawing because it was all very close to the freezing point and there was glaciers. The water was constantly freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing and that speeded up the process of breaking these rocks on the ridge apart. Well, they brought them around it all. Mm -hmm. And that's the effect of water over time and water rolling past them. Do you have any other? Yeah. I think probably be southwest of here, probably south of Pottstown, there's a lot of areas with rocks, and like the farmers have uh, put them into uh, on the edge of the fields. Mm -hmm. And then areas where that hasn't been done, like they're all strewn over every place. And they're darker rocks. Got, um, is that the diabase kind of rock, or is that something else? Um, it, a lot of places, like in, um, like out past. Carlisle and over toward Tuscarora Mountain in South Central Park, there's a lot of limestone outcrops that come up through the state, uh, Green Castle and Hanover in that area. And you see a lot of limestone cropping up through the surface. Um, the darker rocks could be diabase. They are often uh, dark gray or black. Um, yeah, so I'd have to know exactly where it is to tell you for sure. Yeah, it's like yeah, more than Chester County, but along 
It's uh, not far from Route 100 as it goes from Potsdam down to the middle of Chester County. Like okay. the part of yeah, Chester that's, County. that's the yeah. Triassic Lowlands. So that, those would be diabase ridges. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that area well. That's, there used to be, when I took my classes up to Hawk Mountain, there was, when you went up Route 100 and you hit the, um, the boundary between the Piedmont Upland and the Triassic Lowlands, the road turned red right there because they used local rock to pave it, and the local rock was the red shale. But then they repaved it, and so it ruined my whole story because it's now it's, it's dark colored, it's just black asphalt. And you have to get up to 422 to see the red paving. Anything else? There is still a paper factory there, yeah, a paper manufacturing company there, and they, they clean it up so it doesn't smell terrible when we drive through the town anymore. Uh, but I always remember that because my dad's from northwestern Pennsylvania, uh, western New York State, so we drive up from there. I always remember going through Johnsonburg. <laughs> that is Big Jack Hill coming into Ridgeway. It's a very steep descent right into the town. A couple houses at the bottom, you have to do a right turn. So they built another road just for trucks to go a different way rather than that road into town. Anything else? All right. Thank, Thank you all. Thanks again.